This is episode 242 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Spinal Cord Injury with Dr. Eileen Anderson. Hey, everybody. We are Daylon James and Arun Sharma. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge in stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Stem Cell Podcast, rate us and leave a review, please. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. Eileen Anderson from the University of California, Irvine, on the podcast to talk about her research on spinal cord injury and central nervous system disease. We've also got our usual roundup recent highlights in stem cell news that's coming right up but first it's just a few weeks until icr 2023 in boston massachusetts and we can't wait to see you there make sure to visit the stem cell podcast booth in the exhibit hall for a chance to win a prize and learn how you can be featured on an upcoming episode of the podcast you can also meet dalen and i at the meetup hub at 9 30 a.m on friday june 16th we'll see you there Looking forward to meeting all you guys. Please show up. We'd love to chat with you. I'm starting off the roundup today, Arun, with a familiar story. Uh, We covered something very similar a few weeks back, a few episodes back in Science Translational Medicine. Uh, This is about the hypoimmune-induced pluripotent stem cells. Of course, you know, we're talking here specifically about beta cells, beta islets, um, and, you know, the, the unmet disease burden of diabetes is huge, been going on for 100 years. We're still treating them with insulin. We all know the story. Uh, but insulin producing beta cells derived from pluripotent cells and manufactured at scale is a pathway that could really address this unmet need in a way that was decisive. I mean, can you imagine off the shelf cells for everybody who already has diabetes? Um, that would be revolutionary. It would change the game. But of course, it's a challenge to achieve efficient survival and graftment functionality, right? Because there's this immune barrier. Um, and we've talked about this at length. Uh, this is going to be probably a major theme as it has been in the past, but even more so, I think, this year at the ISSCR. And that is the idea of these hypoimmune induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, And we talked about this a a few episodes back, as I said, where uh, Sonia Schrepfer and many of the same authors, Tobias Deuce, Andrew Colony, or Andrew Connolly, sorry, Jeff Millman, I mean, many of all the same authors pretty much on that story as this one. Um, And what they did there and here, same idea, is uh, they had generated uh, hyperimmune pluripotent cells by depleting the HLA class one and two molecules, and then also overexpressing the don't eat me molecule CD47, right? In the previous story, they did that um, in human cells and then uh, transplanted them, human islets transplanted them into these humanized mice, mice with a humanized immune system. So that was an amazing proof of principle there with an intact immune system that these cells could stand up here They did it in macaques, all right? And this is the next preclinical stage. I already thought we were ready to go on this with the mouse preclinical data, but here, I mean, I don't know what's holding them back and I'm sure there's nothing. It's probably moving into clinical trials already. Um, Here they did it in macaque and they transplanted um, hyperimmune pluripotent cells from macaque intramuscularly into four allogeneic rhesus macaques they survived for 16 weeks and different these were undifferentiated cells remember differentiated into several lineages uh when they injected the wild type undifferentiated cells again they were vigorously rejected um they also did the same thing essentially they did in the in the uh, science transitional medicine story which they transplanted human um uh, induced pluripotent hypoimmune uh, pancreatic islets, they transplanted into these diabetic humanized mice. They ameliorated uh, the symptoms. Um, and then here, the, the final piece here uh, was they transplanted then into the macaque, not islets that were differentiated from uh, macaque-induced pluripotent cells, hyperimmune, but they took primary islets from a macaque and then did all the engineering, 
uh, to make them hyperimmune and then transplanted that into a single macaque, allogeneic, and that survived for 40 weeks with no immunosuppression. And the corollary there, they had a control um, macaque that they transplanted with the non-engineered, the regular immune uh, cells, and they were vigorously, quickly rejected uh, again. So this is a big story. I mean, it's a little bit of a recycle, uh, big papers for these these this group here, um, two in a row, telling pretty much the same story. But I think this was necessary and, and a really critical uh, step in moving these cells into the clinic. I mean, they showed in a, a mouse and a humanized background, but here we're a non-human primate. They're showing transplantation of granted in un, undifferentiated cells with long-term survival, but also primary cells that were engineered in the same way. I don't think there's much left proof that you need uh, to move this into human trials. Uh, Arun, what do you think? Yeah, this is a big deal. And again, a bit of a... Um not a rehash, but a, a strengthening of the previous story. I mean, I think the reason why this is a, a nature biotech paper is because of the non-human primate angle and to show the the long-term survival of these HIP edited cells in the rhesus macaque. That's a big deal, and it's a very hard thing to do, obviously. I mean, ask Chuck Murray. He's been working on this for a while as well. Um, but Sean Yusrefer has uh, really pioneered this, you know, these – hypoimmune pluripotent stem cells and the work at SANA is really progressing rapidly towards the clinic. And I think that Dr. Schrepfer actually has a presentation at the ISCR this year. Part of what excites me about this work is not just the application for diabetes and for, for making beta cells, but also just everything else that you can make from these hypoimmune stem cells. I mean, it's indefinite, it's infinite, the possibilities of differentiating these HIP cells into whatever cell lineage you want, whether it's pancreatic beta cells, cardiac cells, and the downstream result is theoretically going to be the same based on the genetic manipulation that they did here. The, the CD47 overexpression, the elimination of those immune proteins enables the production of these custom stem cells that can survive long term without immune re rejection and uh that is so critical and i can't wait to see the the clinical trials the actual human clinical trials that are inevitably going to be taking place very soon with this kind of work yeah real validation for the cd47 don't eat me signal here i was looking at the tweets from uh jeffrey millman and he he mentioned um, he's one of the authors here, you know, he does a lot of beta cell work. And he mentioned that alternative approaches for the kind of immune masking, don't eat me type approaches. Uh, I forget the details, what they specifically were, but similar correlate approaches to, to CD47 re were uh, uh, attempted and didn't work as well. So it looks like CD47 really is perhaps the silver bullet that everyone over there in Stanford has, has been saying. Um, for me also, as you said, it's, it's, it's every you know, off the shelf, everything you can imagine. But in this case, I think beta cells are a really great uh, proof, a, a really great entry point um, clinically, because that's the great thing about this approach with engineering. It's off the shelf. You put it in, you have some kind of, you know, safeguard in there, kind of apoptosis or whatever kind of ripcord, and you can pull back the therapy and these patients aren't going to die overnight, right? You can supplement with the more traditional uh, therapies for diabetes and, and bridge the gap there until you come up with a solution as opposed to other therapies, right? Where you have maybe a regenerative element there. And if you have a ripcord in there and you pull it, then maybe the person's going to drop that on the spot. So I, I think it's a, it's a really great story because you can really smell it that we're right uh, on the cusp uh, of seeing this in, in humans. And it looks like the results are going to be solid. So I can't wait to see like you, Arun, what happens next. Yeah, and the other part of it is just there are so many different avenues for translational therapy and stem cell biology in the in the realm of diabetes right now, right? I mean, last year we had Doug Melton presenting some of the work that Vertex is doing for, in a similar vein, you know, cell therapy for, for alleviating type 1 diabetes initially. But then here you have another approach in the hypoimmune approach for creating, you know, uh, uh, immune resistant pancreatic beta cells. So what I'm trying to say is there's just so many different angles of attack for, for diabetes right now in stem cell biology. And it's, I think, an exciting time to be involved in the field. So moving on to the next paper for the roundup, this is another Nature Biotech paper, actually two back-to-back -back high-profile Nature Biotech papers. This is 
titled Multimodal Spatiotemporal Profiling of Human and Retinal Organoid Development. This is coming from Jay Gray Camp and also Barbara Troutline, who I believe received a, an ISCR Momentum Award, one of the ISCR awards not too long ago, either last ISCR or the, the one before that. So this is a, an organoid-focused story, but it's really taking this concept of the digital organoid to the next level. And this has come up recently in a lot of these organoid based stories is you know can you reconstruct recapitulate some of the architecture of an organoid in this case a retinal organoid in a completely digital virtual setting now this is a, a large part of this paper this is a computational heavy story okay so we know organoids we're all familiar with organoids they're very powerful uh great way to study development and disease but if you're looking at the spatial temporal development of these things, I think incorporating this computational data set and this computational power could be could be useful. So here they actually generated multiplexed protein maps over a retinal organoid time course and also compared that to, of course, the primary adult retinal tissue to see just how close the spatial temporal development of these organoids really is. They created a toolkit to actually visualize the progenitor and neuron location in the organoids, the spatial arrangements of extracellular and subcellular components, and also the patterning in each organoid and also the primary tissues too. In addition to that, and like I mentioned, this is a deep, deep computational study. They generated a single cell transcriptome and chromatin accessibility time course data set, a bunch of additional computational analysis to create a gene regulatory network analysis. Uh, that actually is theoretically driving the development of these retinal organoids. If you thought that wasn't enough, they integrated additional genomic data with uh, spatially segmented nuclei into this atlas-based approach to explore organoid patterning, retinal ganglion, RGC neighborhoods, and just showed that there are certain genetic perturbations, especially with the OTX2 gene pathway, which I know is really important for retinal development, certain genetic perturbations that are critical for retinal organoid development. So that kind of made sense to me. It, that part of the study wasn't as exciting because ultimately it came down to OTX2, which I believe, and I'm, I'm not an eye biologist, I believe that's one of the master regulators of retinal organoid development. So they did all this computational analysis and then came down to OTX2. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I wasn't ex as excited about that. But the power here is in the computational analysis. This is one of the the heaviest computational papers I have ever seen. I mean, that's how it gets into nature biotech, I suppose. And really, it's like you're you're entering the matrix. You're digitizing this particular data set. You're digitizing the organoid to create a completely digital avatar of the organoid uh, in space or in the on your computer on your computer that you can mess around with. I think this isn't the first time I've seen something like this, this digital organoid concept, and it's definitely not going to be the last. Um, I think it's the first time I've seen it in a retinal organoid, but I'm sure there's going to be other approaches that are uh, coming down the pipeline. So we are entering the matrix here, Dale. Yeah, it seems that way. And like you said, when whenever you see something in, in nature, biotechnology, it's kind of like a gateway opening, right? It's like a, a pathway to all the 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 new horizons that are going to be open to you organoids in space as you as you alluded to there i don't know about that but we're getting there and the um for me there's a, like an agreeable symmetry you know the first uh organoid arguably was this uh the optic cup from uh, yoshiki sasai may he rest in peace so it, it's nice to see that we're finally coming around and, and busting through the door to the next chapter of digital organoids also in the eye, but I also wonder, you know, notwithstanding the amazing technical achievement here and, and the potential for hypothesis generation and all the biology and coming down to OTX, as you said, um, where are we with the eye clinically? You know, I wonder if this um, is is uh, uh, reflecting perhaps uh, movement uh, clinically. You know, the eye was meant to be one of the first places where we had therapeutic inroads with the immune privilege and all the progress with the retinal pigment, pigmented epithelium. Um, and I know a lot of people are still working on it, but I wonder, uh, all this organoid work in the basic biology, are we making clinical inroads in the eye the way we are with diabetes? Are we moving those cells into the clinic as quickly as all the other cell types, if you think, Arun? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, Masaya Takahashi was working on this for a while in Japan, and I think some of those clinical trials didn't 
really pan out or maybe they're still in the works but i don't think anybody's put gonna put these retinal organoids into your eye anytime soon i i hope to god that doesn't happen but i think it's a it's a nice parallel to the clinical work right you got to figure out the mechanisms of how these things develop perhaps in order to actually create those ipsc derived retinal pigment epithelial cells that everybody's putting into the eye you know to make them better for clinical therapies. So I think it goes hand in hand. This is definitely a pure basic science study, but the data set could be applicable to those clinical approaches. Yes, a very, very deep data set and perhaps representative of what we're looking forward to in, in days to come. I mean, weeks to come, years to come, all the data we get these days is you need to have, you know, someone specially trained in a computer, you know, that rivals the, the deepest AI to get into it. But uh, I have a story here that goes back, you know, back to the future, old fashioned observation, but using pretty amazing technology. And this is in my wheelhouse, what I know and, and love, uh, which is the blood and the vasculature. You know, of course, all of our organ function, you need to have a, a optimally constructed vascular network um, and really, the business end of that is the capillaries, right? These are the tiny little vessels uh, that are the major conduits, the, the real sole conduits uh, uh, for transport of soluble factors and nutrients, immune cells to all the tissues. You know, every cell is a, a couple uh, cells away. Every cell in the body is a couple cells away from the vasculature, right? You need it. Um, and the endothelial cells that make up those capillaries in the vascular network uh, are, you know, contingent on their birth and remodeling on, on vessel morphogenesis, vascular morphogenesis. Um, and this has been mostly studied in neonatal stages where it's accessible. And that's like this critical window where you get the, the bridging of this morphogenic quality, all the organs taking shape and getting larger to the more homeostatic function in adulthood, where you need to maintain these organs in, in the face of injury or insult and reconstruct the vascular network. But there's really not great understanding of the molecular me mechanisms that are involved in either the maturation or the homeostasis uh, of vessels. And really, the reason why is because you can't watch these things happen, right? Like most uh, processes and science and observation that's static. Um, if it's not happening right before your eyes, it's difficult to make that observation. And the vascular network, it's difficult to, to monitor longitudinally. Um, and also you really can't, although there's all these kind of, you know, branching angiogenesis assays and in vitro vascular genesis, et cetera, you really can't model the bona fide uh, vascular genesis, morphogenesis and homeostasis in vitro, right? And you can't monitor mammalian easily. You know, you got the fish system where you could see right through and all these, um, you know, frog, uh, other vertebrate systems that are amenable to imaging over longitudinal time scales, but not in the mammal, right? Um, so here we go with uh, Valentina Greco uh, from Yale, and, as well as Karen Hershey, uh, who is at University of Virginia Medical School, um, Karen Hershey specializes in endothelium and vasculature, and Valentina Greco specializes in the skin. And what they did here is they combined their talents to longitudinally observe uh, and thereby investigate the cellular, at the cellular level, at the tissue level, at the molecular level, mechanisms that define uh, the maturation of these vascular plexi um, using these subdermal vascular networks and two photon analysis. And what they found uh, by tracking the same, and, and the images in this in this uh, paper are really beautiful in the movies as well. I encourage all of you to have a look because you're for the first time kind of seeing these vascular processes that we've only been able to um, infer. Uh, here they tracked the, a, symbol, a single uh, neonatal endothelial cell in multiple iterations over days and weeks um, and show that the expansion of the vascular network is uh, driven by regression, right? You have this massive network or, or plexus, and then you pare down to optimize the perfusion. And that was understood, but never really visualized in real time. Um, and what they found here is that, it, which was interesting to me, is that the neonatal ECs, um, they evenly they become evenly distributed, but on ablation, 
uh, the neonatal ECs are predisposed to die. So you, they have this kind of focal ablation and the whole endothelial cell just kind of blows up. Whereas at the adult, when you have this local ablation, you have what's called this plasma lemmal response where the, the, the endothelial cell sends out some membrane to try and repair uh, that process, which, which for me was a really notable distinction, I think has a lot of relevance. And finally, they showed, uh, you know, some signaling, they showed some mechanism as VEGFR2 signaling, the underpinning it all, like you with the OTX in, in the eye, I was kind of like, uh, really? VEGF signaling, ha ha, big <laughs> surprise. But I mean, that I think is second, really, to the, the first hand uh, observation, you know, back to the future, just watching these things happen. We can all feast our eyes on it in the supplemental videos, but just watching it happen and understanding for me, the big takeaway was the distinction between the neonatal and the adult. And I think that has a lot of relevance. When we talk about vascularizing organoids, I mean, we're dealing with a cell that's going to, you know, commit suicide if you have any kind of insult versus an adult cell that is more attuned and amenable to this kind of repair process. So I think it's going to be more delicate vascularizing using IPS derived ECs unless we can kind of maybe overlay this adult type process and, and confer some greater survival or robustness on those neonatal ACs during the plexus formation. That's the takeaway for me, but there's a lot more in there for everyone to look at it. a big deal cell paper that was really based in just watching these cells move and pretty incredible stuff. Yeah, this is amazing. I think this is a a tech heavy roundup like we like to do every once in a while. But being able to track a single endothelial cell over the course of development, that is insane. That is absolutely wild. Um, I agree with you. I think the the tech is really driving the strength of this paper. The the VEGFR2 part of it, I think, is more of a validation. It's like, all right, cool. We got this amazing technology. We can make all these observations, just like in the previous study with the retinal organoids. And then at the end, we got to do a proof of concept. Okay, let's pick our favorite gene that's known to implicate in these pathways, you know, the OTX with the eye and the VEGF for endothelial cells. And okay, it works. Great. Awesome. And I think that strengthens the overall mechanistic part of the study. But again, I think the the strength of the both these stories, all of these stories is in the tech and how the tech is actually enabling you to make those mechanistic observations. Yeah, uh, you said it, to be able to track a single endothelial cell, but also to be able to see it in context and in the context of this injury and remodeling. So a, a great uh, tool here, seeing the forest and the trees, so to speak, and, and getting the whole picture. So a great story from a, a great friend of the show, Valentina Greco. We're going to have to have her on to talk about this and her ongoing work one day soon. Absolutely. And moving on to the last roundup paper, also coming from another friend of the show who we had on the show not too long ago. This is June Wu. And also talking about a topic that you know and love, and that's cows. No, just kidding. Blastocysts. Blastocysts. You can, I'm sure you like cows too, but these are actually bovine blastocyst-like structures created from human pluripotent stem cells, not not human pluripotent stem cells. They're not cows made from humans. They are bovine blastocysts made from cow pluripotent stem cells. Important clarification there. But yeah, this is building off of a lot of the work that Jun Wu has been doing over the last couple of years, making these in vitro blastocyst-like structures, these artificial blastoids that they like to call them, these surrogate blastocysts. Initially, they were creating them from uh, from human cells, and now they're creating them from bovine, from cows, from cow cells. And the implication here is for um, assisted reproduction for farm animals. That's that's one downstream application for, for this particular technology. So understanding the mechanisms of blastocyst formation and implantation is you know critical for improving farm animal reproduction. They straight up say that early on in the paper. They're not trying to do anything crazy. I think they're just trying to understand the reproductive processes for, for, for cows and other farm animals. And this is important because this is a huge, huge industry, especially in Texas, which is where Jun Wu's lab is located. But to actually better understand the developmental processes in different farm animals like cows, uh, you need a supply of embryos. And that's why this study is what it is. It's trying to address that limitation in the, the embryo supply for cows and hopefully using these cow blastoids as a surrogate. So they developed an efficient method to actually create bovine cow blastocyst-like structures, which they call blastoids in the realm of what they did before, uh, by assembling different bovine blastocyst uh, tropoblast stem cells 
and also these expanded potential stem cells that they had alluded to in their previous studies. It's a short cell stem cell paper, you know, just a couple figures, just a proof of concept, and uh, actually one really cool application that I'll get to. Um, they the bovine blastocysts resemble real cow blastocysts in their morphology, their cell composition, gene expression. Did a bunch of single cell transcriptomics. You have to, of course, make the comparison between these developmental analogs and the real deal, just like with did in their other story. They also grow pretty similarly in vitro, and then. This is, I think, this is the the really cool part of this. It's it's one step towards the the implantation and the clinical translation part of it. But they tried to get as close as they could uh, at this point. So they actually put these bovine cow blastocysts into into a cow, into a female cow, and they found that they elicit the maternal recognition of pregnancy. So they're actually uh, inducing the signal of pregnancy just by being implanted into into the the, the female cow. Um, so that's really interesting. It's it's eliciting some of these signals that are normally elicited during standard uh, natural pregnancy. So they're doing something right. I don't think those signals were perfectly on par with what you would get with like a true natural bovine embryo that's developed in 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 utero in the uterus, but. That's a really neat proof of concept. So it's a it's an accessible in vitro model for studying embryogenesis in in cows and in farm animals, and maybe it can be used to actually improve reproductive efficiency in livestock species. That's the the big downstream potential here. Yeah, sometimes I wonder if June is just like, hey, I got these cells lying around. Let's make some blastoids out of it. But. Uh, it, uh... In this case, I don't think that's true. I mean, uh, bovine, while you may seem it's not really clinical relevant, maybe not, um, there is a lot of you know relevance to agriculture and livestock, and also I think to basic biology, uh, the livestock element you, you alluded to it, but like you know breeding is is good, but the the end game I think in livestock is like cloning, so you get these really you know great high producing. Um, heifers or something, and then you clone them so that they can be on par and have, you know, max efficiency, or even you want to get crazy, the whole idea with the convergence of like cultured meats and some other kind of sci-fi elements here, the idea of just growing uh, meat in a, in a way that like maybe is akin to embryogenesis minus the whole neural development thing, you know, you've seen it all in that movie, The Island, and plenty of other, you know, dystopian horror, sci-fi. But I don't think it's out of the question in terms of long-term reality. So there, there's some real relevance to society here. And, and to me, more more than anything, uh, there's just development. You know, when you talk about mammalian development, every animal has their own thing, uh, their own reproductive pro process, their own, you know, pre-implantation and peri-implantation development. Um, and the cow's no different. And there's a lot of interesting biology there. You know, the cow implantation begins at day 16 to 18 post embryo elongation, you know, and, and it's like all these, you know, ruminants, other types of, of, of mammals, sometimes, you know, the post gastrulation or peri gastrulation implantation, there's a lot of nuance to mammalian development surrounding the implantation process and gastrulation in those early stages. So, Having uh, the potential to make these bovine blastoids, I think, is a is an inroad there, and, and could maybe provide a lot of insight um, to maybe not our own bi biology per se, but maybe a lever that could give us a a, a bit of a insight. Yeah, I, I I agree. I think the other interesting part of it, and I was just reflecting on this, the the tech and the genetic manipulation that we as humanity have been doing to livestock recently is. It's pretty incredible. I mean, just I was just making a list of it on this sheet of paper that I have right now in front of me, just off the top of my head. I mean, one, we have the myo D cows, right? The the myo D cows that are just super muscle cows that can basically kick my kick my butt if they want to. Uh, they don't need to hit the gym. But yeah, I mean, the, that's one example of you know genetic manipulation in cows. Of course, Dolly the sheep, right, was a sheep, is a livestock animal, and that's uh, one of the hallmarks in stem cell biology right now that happened twenty years ago. Uh, also, the pig xenotransplantation that happened not too long ago, that's, again, livestock species that was able to be genetically manipulated to ultimately create a heart 
that was somewhat immunocompatible in a human subject that was transplanted at the University of Maryland last year. So I think this is, if you step step back and think about it, the amount of biotech that's going into the farm animal industry is pretty astounding. And uh, this is just another, another example, another uh, data point to add to that, I suppose. Yeah, not to mention the the sheep that make have spider's milk protein in their milk and whatnot. I mean, there's this idea that become more and more prevalent of uh, livestock as kind of bio repositories. And I don't think that's going anywhere if, if Jun Wu has anything to say about it. But that's a bit of a rabbit hole. Uh, before we talk to our guest about perhaps stimulating ideas like this and others, we have a quick message from Stem Cell Technologies. Neuroscientists looking for more predictive power in their disease models are increasingly adopting human pluripotent stem cells in their research. Stem Cell Technologies offers products, protocols, and training to support HPSC-derived neural models. Explore their collection of technical videos and webinars on neurological disease modeling by visiting www.stemcell.com slash neural disease model. All right, everybody, joining us today on the show is Dr. Eileen Anderson, who is director of the Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center at University of California, Irvine. Dr. Anderson's lab investigates the interactions of transplanted stem cell populations within the injured niche, including the role of the evolving inflammatory microenvironment in stem cell fate and migration decisions. They also investigate the role of inflammatory mechanisms in degeneration and regeneration in the injured central nervous system. Dr. Anderson, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. And your work has focused on translational applications and approaches for spinal cord repair with an emphasis on cell-based therapies for restoring spinal cord function. And I mean, as a lot of folks probably know, spinal cord repair after acute injury was almost, you know, one of the fur early focal points of pluripotent stem cell therapy, referring to like the Geron trial, of course, and we're not going to talk too much about that, but your lab takes a bit of a different approach to answer that critical unmet medical need of spinal cord repair. So could you start off by giving us an overview of what you're working on right now and in this area of cell-based therapy for spinal cord repair? Sure. So um, my lab in the, in the space of that aspect of my lab, cell, cell based therapy for spinal cord repair, is really trying to understand kind of why things go right sometimes and why things go wrong sometimes. So, the cell populations that we've worked um, most with are multipotent, right? So, they can make any CNS cells, neurons, oligos, astrocytes. And um, it turns out in all of the preclinical, sort of translationally oriented studies that we do that they listen an awful lot to the environment that you put them in. And so one of the things that we realized as we were kind of marching down this train from a translational perspective is that we had better understand that a lot better than, than we did when we started. So what sorts of things are around them that they're taking information from? How does that influence them for their fate, their migration, their overall engraftment? And then can we put together kind of the puzzle of what that means in terms of success from the point of view of what's going to be, you know, a cell line and a transplantation circumstance that's going to be give you efficacy versus fail to give you efficacy because, you know, we see all of those different kinds of outcomes. So that has led us down the path of looking at the inflammatory microenvironment a lot and what stuff there is in the inflammatory microenvironment that these cells listen to, what cell types and what molecules that they're making and how that signaling kind of happens. Yeah, a, a lot of your work is focused on the influence of the innate immune response and complement pathways on stem cell behavior in, in both the native microenvironment of the injured spinal cord, as well as in the context of cell transplantation, right? Um, and innate immunity, as opposed to adaptive immunity, typically mediates the non-specific response to germs and foreign substances that, that enter the body. And in this eLife paper you published a couple years back, you show that a component of the complement cascade, C1Q, actually modulates neural stem cell behavior. So, I mean, so accustomed to talking about overcoming the immune barrier and immune rejection to avoid uh, rejection of these cell-based therapies. Does your work suggest that we can also enhance 
some elements or like hyperactivate some elements of the immune response. And, and that would lead to improvement in uh, uh, neural stem cell therapies. Yes and no, I would say. So, I mean, so you're spot on, right? The adaptive immune response is the, the really critical part about rejection that happens later. It's a huge problem for us in terms of like us as a field, in terms of cell transplantation therapies. It's a major barrier that really, frankly, to make progress with in terms of our next stage of clinical trials is a big one. We, we need to get a good dent in that to be able to move forward as a field. Um, but the innate immune response is is exactly what it sounds right. It's kind of Johnny on the spot. It happens much earlier than the adaptive immune response is coming in. Neutrophils are into an injured environment in the central nervous system where you've broken down the blood brain or the blood spinal cord barrier within hours, you know, certainly um, peaking at around 12 or, or 24 hours after an injury where you've blown out the barrier. And those cells, it turns out, make a lot of stuff that stem cells are listening to. And so if you're thinking in a preclinical situation that you might be transplanting into a scenario where those innate immune cells, neutrophils, for example, or macrophages, microglia, as resident immune cells coming in a little bit later, if they're gonna be around, then the cells that you're transplanting are most likely gonna be listening to what they have to say. So what we showed was that there are a number of complement molecules, C3A is one, C3A, Q is, is another, and the eLife paper is really focused heavily on, on C1Q, um, that in the context of the CNS do something that's surprising, and that is that they are actually signaling to these cells. And so why is that surprising? C1Q, for anybody who's an immunologist out there, is all about activating the complement cascade and phagocytosis and debris and doing stuff that is not about talking to other cells. So there were no um, known receptors for C1Q that would let it talk to another cell, induce a set of intracellular signaling pathways. And that's what we identify in that eLife paper in the context of neural stem cells. Is that going to make cells do a better job? Probably activating that set of pathways is not what we want to do. Where we think that we can make things better by understanding that basic biology is by taking away that signal. You know, so one of the things that we show there is if we as an example, one of the receptors we identified was CD44. CD44, of course, has other ligands. We just show that C1Q is one of them that we hadn't appreciated before. And if we knock out CD44, or if we deplete C1Q in the microenvironment, then we can change the way the cells that we've transplanted acutely after injury behave. So a cell population that um, would have failed to give repair, and by repair here, I just mean locomotor recovery, now, by doing one of those two things, we can transform it into a cell population that shows efficacy, right? So it listens to that microenvironment in a different way. It migrates more. It changes what the fate preponderance is of the cells that you transplant. And so, yeah, I think by manipulating what these cells are listening to, um, either by changing ligands or changing the receptors that the cells are carrying, that opens up some different possibilities for us from a translational perspective. Hmm. Yeah, and your lab is definitely very translationally oriented. That's no doubt. And I think it's really exciting that work from your lab has supported, you know, IND filings, new investigational, uh, new drug filings for an FDA-approved phase one trial of human neural stem cells in, uh, you know, in PMD, for example, Pelizaeus, Mersbacher disease, and uh, also, you know, this phase one two clinical trial in thoracic spinal cord injury (SCI), like what we're talking about. I mean, this is no doubt a dream for most translational stem cell biologists, and most folks don't get that far to see their own life's work being moved to the clinic and ultimately helping people in need. That's what it's all about, right? I mean, it's no secret that the FDA approval process for cell-based therapies, it's a, it's a long road and this has been documented forever. But I mean, tell us about your own experience on the, on the regulatory and the FDA side of things and the approval side of things and actually moving these therapies towards clinical trials. Yeah, so that's it. <laughs> I mean, it's a risky game for a scientist at an academic center to participate in, right? And so um, for my lab, for, for my work, I knew early on that I was really interested in translation. And so that was a, a worthwhile place to kind of put our chips down. We all try and balance that, you know, with basic science, totally discovery science at the, at the same time. I think it's really important to be engaged on both ends of that spectrum um, in reality. I think that's where 
we can make our basic science have some impact. And you can't do good translational science in the absence of basic science in, in reality. Um, so for a lot of our my early work, our early work that was in the translational realm, that um, was partnering with an outside company, right, who had the cells but didn't have the tools to go after central nervous system injuries or, or diseases. And so that for um, our kind of launch into this domain was a, um, a really fruitful set of collaboration that, that happened in, the, in that early period, right? Um, where we just tested in translational models that had applications, as you mentioned, for a couple of different kinds of disease states, could we develop a model where we could probe the capacity of cell transplants to, to yield repair? It was so exciting to be involved in that early work. And the people who came to my lab during that period, my grad students and postdocs and you know, my super close collaborators at, at UCI, Brian Cummings, who's on, on faculty here, you know, was really um, a, a, a huge part of that work. It was all a collaborative effort. It was so exciting for all of us to have that idea that what we were doing could move across that barrier into actual testing in, in, in patients who are suffering with these, these long-term conditions. So um, it's challenging, but it's really exciting for, for folks to get involved on that side of the research sphere. Yeah, super exciting. And Arun and I and our guests, we, we talk a lot on the show about what a great time it is to be in the game. This current era of cell-based therapies with hundreds of clinical trials in the offing that are likely to validate, I, I think, much of the therapeutic potential that we've been hoping for and promising. Um, but the road has not exactly been smooth, right? Arun, alluded to the Geron trial, which had a, a pretty abrupt and, and disappointing end. And in your own research, you've had to power through some of your own disappointments, right? Here I'm referring to your work with neural stem cells from Stem Cells Inc. that you tested in a model of cervical spinal cord injury. The results showed no evidence of efficacy. Um, and with the stakes as high as they are, it's a huge relief for me, at least I think it's a huge relief to see the rigor and transparency with which you and other stakeholders are testing these cellular products, but it must be tough to find that the efforts of more than a decade culminated in a, in a negative result. Can you can you tell us about that experience and also what happens next when you get a punch to the gut like that? Yeah, so and that's you bring out some really good points, right? So this is a part of the challenge of working in that space. At the end of the day you have to follow the data, right? The data is the data. It, and if you're doing your experiments well and with rigor and in an unbiased way, um, sometimes it is going to punch you in the gut, as, as you said, and you have to be ready to say, like this thing where we thought we are, like we're, we're not there, it, it's not ready to go. There's something about the scale up or the basic biology, or the variance between cell lines, you know, a gazillion things that it can be when you're working with something that isn't the, like, it, it's not a small molecule that you can make in an easy way. It's, it's, a, it's a living thing that has pleiotropic effects in the environments that we're putting it in, right? And the level at which we understand that in terms of stem cell biology is still, you know, in its infancy is maybe too strong, but it's not certainly where I think we all hope we're going to be in, in 10 or 20 years, right? There are a lot of unknowns in terms of that process. So um, it's painful, but I think it's a part of what it means to, to bring this, you know, new set of possibilities, these, these new technologies forward into clinical translation. Um, there's a different aspect to that challenge, which is the company aspect, right? And if you're an academic scientist and you're collaborating outside of academia in terms of your work, that invokes a whole other set of complications in, in terms of how things work. Companies have to stay alive, right? They have their own goals in terms of moving forward and they have a time scale um, that they need to move on in order to stay afloat that is not the way that we operate in academia, right? So there's a little bit of a culture clash there in, in terms of how things work and, and how one makes judgment calls. Um, 
I think that's a really challenging space. I think companies are really necessary partners in terms of advancing cell therapies. But at the same time, I think good and bad things happen with that every day. There's a huge investment of venture capital, right, that can really drive fields forward. And, and the resources of companies are pretty important to fund most, certainly phase one, phase two, and definitely phase three clinical trials, right, to advance the technology. But the lens that they're looking at, at translation through is just different than what you're looking at it through when you're in an academic setting. So I think ultimately, you know, out of that experience, certainly in my mind, one, one of the things I think we need to think about is can we, can, how far can we drive things in an academic setting so that we make the, the best trade-off that we can, like the most productive environment to advance cell therapies to a point where if it's something that you've discovered in your lab or you've worked with strongly in your lab, you can really set it up to be poised for success to the maximal degree. And, and in some ways, honestly, I, I think that academic labs are in some cases better suited to be able to do that, right? To keep control of something, to understand the details that, that we need to in order to bring it across those first lines, the clinical trials. The challenge for that is that a lot of academic labs aren't ready to make that jump, right? I mean, when I started working in this space as a, a young professor, the idea that I was going to work on something in my lab that would go into patients was just like a little bit anathema, right? And so in academia, we sometimes, I think oftentimes, get stuck on the very early stage. And it's really hard for us to think about advancing it out of the lab into clinical trial. And so that's, you know, it's just a set of trade-offs that, that hit on both sides there. After that crash, in terms of our early translational experiences, um, and, and after my lab recovered a little bit, we actually went back and decided, you know, no, there is enough potential here that we just need to go back to the basics, right? That's what we can do in an academic lab is understand the basic biology better so that we can ad advance again through the translational spectrum, but knowing enough, right, to increase our potential for success there. So, I mean, that's what we did. We, we went back to the drawing board. We made our own cell lines. We made a bunch of them. We did a ridiculous set of experiments. Um, a senior scientist in my lab, Katja Pilti, was like so pivotal in this. And then we compared them, right? Something you would never do in a, in a company setting and said, why are some succeeding and why are some failing? And, and can we learn from that in a way that will just make us more efficient on the translational side of things? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, thank you for being transparent about that. I mean, cell therapy is hard. It doesn't work a lot of the time. And I think one thing that's maybe going for us these days, I think there's a lot of folks both in academia and industry that go back and forth a lot. So, you know, folks who have academic experience, they make the jump into industry and vice versa. And I'll, I think that's a good thing because perhaps that can help accelerate academia. That's perhaps one of the downsides, as you alluded to, things take a while. And then from the industry perspective, it's good to have that fundamental basic science knowledge too, to kind of drive that translation. So cell therapy is hard. And you mentioned new technologies that your lab is working on. I mean, one in particular are some bioengineering based approaches for spinal cord repair, such as using biomaterial bridges to actually enable regeneration and re-entry of these corticospinal tract neurons into the spinal cord after injury. I mean, this is a paper that was published in Biomaterials a few years ago and actually showed functional recovery of forelimb function. And this idea of you know the biodegradable scaffold, it's been around for a little while, but integrating it into spinal cord injury, I think is pretty interesting, especially with like all the advances in biocompatible materials that have intersected with stem cell biology in recent times. So tell us a little bit about that kind of unique approach, this kind of biomaterials, bioengineering approach and you know where where that is right now when it comes to spinal cord repair. Yeah. So the the biomaterials projects I've really loved for, for a long time. So I'm actually a bioengineer as an undergrad who kind of stumbled over into neuroscience for my, my PhD. Um, and we have a longtime collaborator uh, in my group, Bonnie Shea, who's at University of Michigan, who a bunch of years ago now came up with this idea of making a biodegradable scaffold. Um, and I met him at a meeting and we talked and I was like, yeah, scaffold's not going to do it. You got to like axons will grow in and they'll just get stuck. They won't go out the other side. 
a million people can make axons grow in. That's not enough, right? You got to do something more. And so he was like, well, what if we put holes in them? <laughs> so we make we make sort of channels that we can convince the axons to go down and then maybe they'll go through. And I'm like, yeah, maybe. So um, we, that basic conversation launched, you know, what's probably almost 20 years at this point of, of collaboration of just kind of figuring that out. And so the, the cool thing about lots of different biomaterials, but, but this work with the, the PLG bridges in particular is that the axons, um, descending axons, including the corticospinal tract, which is important because it's just a tract that doesn't like to grow a bunch. It's, it's refractory in, in terms of, it, you know, no central nervous system tracts like to grow a whole bunch serotonergic fibers will some, but they don't really regenerate and reconnect everything up. We didn't, we wouldn't have spinal cord injury as a problem, right? So, so the, the CST and other tracks will grow into these bridges that grow along the channels. And then most importantly, they, the, they grow out the other side. And in recent studies, we've shown that not only do they grow out the, the other side, it's not published data yet, but they will reconnect a circuit that connects like four limb muscle all the way back to sensory motor cortex. And so the functional locomotor recovery that we're seeing is really built around functional reconnection of, of the circuit. And then you alluded to the idea of, of stem cells and whether biomaterials and, and stem cells have some space together. Um, and that I think is a really important idea because the cortical spinal tract is a great example most of those fibers, 99% in humans are myelinated, something like 85 or 86% in, in rodents are myelinated. Myelination is important there because it's got to go a long way to get the signals through. Um, but when we put these bridges in, a real paucity of the fibers that regenerate through become myelinated, maybe 15%. And so the regeneration alone may not be enough. And um, what we're thinking is that the combination of those bridges and the kind of natural regeneration that they stimulate with a cell population is what you're ultimately going to need to get really, you know, improve the functional reconnection that you can get there. Yeah, I'm glad you ended there because, I mean, that's kind of at the center of my next question. I mean, first, you mentioned your collaboration longstanding with Lonnie Shea, who, you know, you know, but maybe our audience may not know. It's hard to believe though. That he's an all-star biomaterial scientist at, at University of Michigan. And with the importance of microenvironment and stem cell differentiation, also like specialized cell function, I think it, it's it's appreciated in, in adult niches as, as well. It's becoming increasingly clear. Um, bioengineers are in high demand, right? But uh, stem cell biologists with an engineering background like yourself um, are in short supply. Hence, Lonnie is tremendously prolific. He works with a ton of researchers across the globe on diverse organ system. I mean, he's doing artificial ovary. I work in the reproductive medicine and the ovary specifically. I know Lonnie Shea. Everybody knows Lonnie Shea. So yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's the guy. Um, and he has a lot of collaborations, uh, but, you know, collectively, and, and you have kind of alluded to this in your answers already, that we've spent so much time, placed so much emphasis on figuring out the right cell, right? And the right cells are population of cells and combinations of cells over the last two plus decades. But still, uh, effectively addressing spinal cord injury remains a major challenge, as you know, um, and as you answered there, you know, the, the, there's this hybrid solution combining the biology of the cell with the engineering approach. And we've asked this question before on the show, do we need to grow the solution or we need to build the solution? And I think generally the consensus is that it's going to take the, the, the intrinsic properties of the cells as well as some extrinsic form and, and shaping and engineering. But how do you, how do you, Build that into your lab. I mean, you have trainees uh, that come in, presumably focus on solving spinal cord injury. But is there a, a are there engineers and scientists hybrids out there? I mean, is it is it is a class of scientists that's increasing in its availability? Or do you emphasize that kind of hybrid training in your own lab? What what's your take on, on that? Yeah, I I think that's a, a a great question and a great set of points. I I think. This is a class 
of interdisciplinary science that's really increasing a lot. Um, I think many schools, UCI is, is one of them that's really um, trying to emphasize partnerships between, for example, School of Medicine and School of Engineering to drive these interdisciplinary domains forward. University of Michigan is a is a great example, right? Their biomaterials department sits in between engineering and medicine, right? And that's an unusual structure. Partly that's because of the potential for medical device development, you know, and and a lot of successes that there've been in in that domain. But where we are with with stem cells and understanding how, you know, cells behave on biomaterials and what biomaterials are, or or how we can use you know, 3D printing and bioengineering techniques to enhance organoid formation, for example, in the area of stem cell biology. I think we're just seeing the beginning of an inflection point where that is is really taking off, and that aspect of interdisciplinary science, I, I think, is already uh, on the upswing, and, and it's only going to get bigger. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned how UCI is kind of perfectly positioned to be that institute, that cross interdisciplinary institute that can facilitate some of that next generation of science. And I mean, you've been at UCI for, for a while now, which is like, you know, it's one of the premier schools in the UC University of California system. I know, I mean, just down the road in LA here. I mean, it, UCI may not be as well known as some of the other UC counterparts, but it's really a powerhouse in stem cell biology and collaborative science. I mean, of course, there's a lot of CERM funding involved and also. So there's support from the Gross family who will help contribute to the foundation of the major stem cell center on campus. But just give us a pitch for UCI for, for the, those of us who may not be as familiar with the school. Tell us about what makes it so special and why you've been there for so long and why it's a great place for stem cell research. Oh, what a great question for me. So thank you for that. Um, I would highlight a couple of things about UCI. I have been here a long time. My, my, my entire career as faculty has, has been at UCI, on up through assistant professor to becoming director for the center. Um, there are a couple of things I would highlight. It's a young campus, um, as, as UCs go, right? Only UC Merced is, is younger than UCI is. So the growth here has really been exponential over the last 20 or 25 years. Um, growth in enrollment for undergraduates, for grads, for, you know, the number of faculty we have on campus. Our acronym is under construction indefinitely, in case you didn't know that. Um, and the cool thing about that, though, is that very dynamic in terms of the students and faculty that are here all the time. I have worked at other places across the country. And um, as I tell, when we're interviewing faculty and students, the thing that really distinguishes UCI for me is how collaborative it is. And so this whole idea of making partners with engineering and having interdisciplinary science is just like right at home here. Um, so it's powerhouse in that regard. It's clinical enterprise is um, building hugely. Right now we're in the mil middle of building out a, a billion dollar medical campus. Um, that's a stone's throw from, from our main campus here. Super exciting times from that regard. And at, at the same time, you know, as you know, being in California, um, there's a big emphasis across the UCs and within California about um, making sure that we're serving all Californians, right? Underrepresented minorities, medically underserved communities, um, all of these things. And something that I personally am very proud of at, at UCI as a first-gen college student myself is that UCI really puts its its emphasis where its you know proverbial mouth is there. So um, we have more first-generation college students than any other UC campus. We're a minority-serving institution for um, uh, um, Hispanics and um, probably soon to be Asians. Um, and all of those um, aspects of UCI come together, I think, to create a really unique environment that's just a lot of fun to work in. Wow, that's a great pitch. Even what maybe someone, I know you're joking, but some might think a, a negative connotation under construction indefinitely, but I think... That's a great metaphor for all of our appreciation of science and, and, and clinical translation. I mean, all of our work and efforts, it's, a, it's under constant revision and, and reconstruction. So um, I love it. I would love to be in a world under construction indefinitely. And, and you make a strong sell for you, UC Irvine, for any of those people looking to go or, or, or become faculty. Listen to Dr. Anderson 
and also listen to all the great insights she shared with us. Uh, what a great interview. Before we let you get away, though, we have a couple science peripheral questions we're going to ask. Uh, first, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about this, because I, I mean, you're, you're giving me so much in this interview. What is the biggest misconception, do you think, about science that you'd like to resolve? So I think um, the biggest misconception, so by young students, um, and certainly with the public, which I think about a lot in terms of communicating out to, you know, real people that are around us and not necessarily involved in science as an enterprise, is that science is one and done, right? And it's not. Science is really rinse and repeat in all different kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. From a replicating studies point of view, which is such, such a critical element of, of what we have to do, what we should be doing in our labs, but also to how we acquire new information, right? And so when I interact, for example, with, with patients or caregivers in the, the spinal cord injury community, um, there's you know understandably an idea that we just kind of march in a line from one thing to the next and it all makes sense. And then we get to the ends and, and so we have a translational study or we have a success, right? And you guys know that that's not the case, right? We're one step forward, one step to the side, two steps back, three steps forward, right? It, it, it's a constant, as we're discovering something new, that takes us to the side in a way that maybe advances us much better, but it's unpredictable, right? And the role of that unpredictableness um, is what gets us things like PCR, right? Or CRISPR-Cas9 that, that change the entire dynamic of how a field operates. And so science really can't be linear. That's not what it's supposed to be. And I think appreciating all those digressions and the importance of, of basic science to feed that whole chain forward into the clinical domain is um, something that gets lost just all too easily in our conversations. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we talk about that every, you know, revolution of the tech, we ask the same questions with better resolution and find things we never would have considered. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great field to be in. You're always moving forward. Um, a lot of moving back though, too, as you said. Finally, fill in the blanks. First, when I'm not conducting research, I am. Well, if at all possible, I am with my family. Um, but uh, I really like to do stuff outside. I ride horses and I hike and I ski and I like to be in the out. Wow, I bet you can do all of those things within like a square mile of where you live. That's what they say about California. You do everything. You ski in the morning and then you go swimming in the afternoon, you bastards in California. All right, I'm showing my, <laughs> my stripes a little bit too much. It's chilly here in New York still. I'm waiting for summer. Let me move on. Next, if I could have one superpower, it would be. Oh, I think I should have prepared for this one. My one superpower would be Hmm, to always ask the right question. Wisdom. You got it. You did it. Congratulations. Finally, I can't start the day without... Uh, exercise. Hmm. I work out almost every morning because otherwise I'm a surly person and that's bad for the people that work with me. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Stay happy. Stay fit for all of our sakes and uh <laughs> come back again and share with us again eileen this has been such a, a delightful conversation and and we really appreciate your you know transparency and and frank truths um uh, it, it really is uh important to share and we appreciate it well, it was delightful talking with you guys thanks for inviting me all right, everybody, that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or via email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. And soon after that, we're going to be in Boston for the ISSCR. Can't wait. Looking forward to that week and looking forward to the next episode.